Daniel and his friends. It was noontime in the city of Jerusalem. The temple school for boys had been dismissed. Daniel and his three special friends were hurrying home to lunch when suddenly a trumpet sounded. Ta'i! 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 shrilled the trumpet. It was the noontime call to prayer. Three times a day, morning, Noon and night, a priest came out on the temple porch and blew on a ram's horn trumpet. Ta'i! 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 It's time for prayers! Daniel turned about face toward the temple. His friends turned about face toward the temple. All the people of Jerusalem stopped whatever they were doing and faced toward the temple. With heads bowed, they prayed to the God of heaven. At home, Daniel's mother served pulse for lunch. Pulse is food like beans and vegetables, brown bread, berries, and dates. Daniel liked pulse. Pulse would make him grow tall. Pulse would make him grow strong. Pulse would make him get good grades in school. Daniel his three friends, and all the people of Jerusalem felt safe in their city. For hadn't the city a high stone wall around it? And were there not strong gates in the wall, with a watchtower above each gate, where watchmen kept watch day and night? If Daniel listened, he would hear the watchman call. First watch, all is well. And later, second watch, all is well. And still later, third watch, all is well. But one day, all was not well. The watchman hurried out of the watchtower, blew a warning blast on his trumpet, and shouted, An enemy approaches. Quickly, the gates were shut and barred. Men mounted city walls. Boys climbed rooftops. Far away, so far that soldiers and camels looked like a line of creeping, crawling bugs, came the dread army, the feared army of Babylon. Closer, closer, closer the army came. The army of Babylon pitched camp near Jerusalem. The soldiers built great battering ram machines and pushed them up beside the wall. Crash! 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 All day long, the battering rams beat and battered the wall of Jerusalem. Crash! 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 Finally, after many days, a part of the high stone wall gave way. The army of Babylon marched into Jerusalem. Some of the soldiers climbed the hill to the temple and took away the temple's golden vessels as the king of Babylon had commanded them to do. Some soldiers stood guard, while other soldiers took men and boys prisoners. They took Daniel and his three friends. The army marched the prisoners toward Babylon. Soldiers on camels led the way. Then came the prisoners, chained together. Next, donkeys bearing the golden vessels. Then more soldiers. For days and days, the procession marched across a hot, sandy desert. Daniel's sandals wore out. His friend's sandals wore out. The hot sand burned their feet. They were thirsty. They were tired. But on and on they had to march until they came to Babylon. The king of Babylon sat on his royal throne while soldiers paraded the prisoners before him. Said the king to the captain of the army, Choose boys from among the prisoners, goodly boys. Give them food from my table to eat, and give them of my wine to drink. They shall go to school for three years to learn the wisdom of Babylon. Daniel and his three friends were chosen. 
Prince Melzar was given charge over all the boys. That evening, Daniel and his friends talked together. We cannot eat the king's food, said Daniel. It has been offered to idols. And besides, the king's food is not the best food for boys. Neither can we drink the king's wine. What shall we do? The boys asked one another. Then Daniel thought of a plan. Let's ask Melzar to give us pulse to eat and water to drink instead of the king's food and wine. It's a good plan, agreed the three friends. Daniel and his friends went to see Prince Melzar. They bowed politely, then asked for pulse and water instead of the king's food and wine. Melzar shook his head no. If the king should see you looking thinner than the other boys and learn that I had given you pulse and water, he might, he might even cut off my head. Please try us for 10 days, begged Daniel. So Melzar agreed to give them pulse and water for 10 days. Then we shall see, he said. Although Daniel and his friends were far from home, and there was no sound of a ram's horn trumpet to remind them, they did not forget to pray. Morning, noon, and night, Daniel opened his window toward the temple back in Jerusalem and prayed to the God of heaven. He asked God to bless the pulse and water and to please let it make them strong so that Melzar might know that pulse and water were better for boys than the king's food and wine. When ten days had passed, Prince Melzar called all the boys before him. He looked at their faces. He felt their arms. He found that Daniel and his friends were fairer and fatter than the boys who ate the king's food and drank the king's wine. So ever after, during the three years of school, Prince Melzar gave Daniel and his friends pulse to eat and water to drink. One, two, three years went by. School was over for Daniel and his friends. They had grown taller. Had they grown wiser? The king himself would test them. Daniel and his friends, dressed in clean clothes, with hair combed and sandals polished, stood before the king of Babylon. The king asked them question after question. And lo, the king found Daniel and his three friends ten times wiser than all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel and the Lions Many years had gone by since Daniel had been taken a prisoner to Babylon. He had grown to be a wise, good man. And now a new king sat upon the royal throne. The new king soon learned that no matter what happened, he could trust Daniel. So the new king made Daniel ruler next to himself over all the people of the kingdom, over all the wise men of the kingdom, over all the princes of the kingdom. The princes became angry when the king made Daniel ruler over them. So angry they began plotting a way to get rid of Daniel, said a sly prince. We'll find some fault in him and go tell the king. So the princes watched Daniel but not a fault could they find in him. Daniel didn't lie, he didn't cheat, he was never late, he did his work well. I know what we can do, said the sly prince. Tell us, chorused the princes, what can we do? Have you not seen Daniel open his window toward Jerusalem, morning, noon, and night? Have you not heard him pray to the God of heaven? asked the sly prince. Well, we'll write a law that anyone who prays to any god except the king for 30 days shall be thrown into the lion's den. The king will be so pleased, said a prince. He'll not think of Daniel. He'll seal the law. Ho, 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 laughed the princes. Daniel will be thrown into the lion's den. The princes wrote the law and took it to the king. Oh, king, we wish to honor you, said the sly one. We have written a law that anyone who prays to any god 
except you, O king, for thirty days, he shall be thrown into the lion's den. The king was pleased. He asked for wax that he might seal the law. A servant dripped melted wax on the paper. The king pressed his ring into it, and so the law was sealed. It could not be changed. Messengers were stationed on the city streets to read the new law to the people. Hear ye, hear ye, shouted the messengers. He who prays to any god other than the king for 30 days shall be thrown into the lion's den. Fathers and mothers stopped to listen. Boys and girls stopped to listen. Daniel stopped to listen to the reading of the strange new law. Several of the princes hurried down the street that led to Daniel's house. They hid where they could see the window that he always opened when he prayed. They saw Daniel come home and go into the house. Would Daniel open his window and pray as always? Perhaps he would pray in his closet today. Maybe he wouldn't pray at all until the 30 days were past. Anxiously, the princes watched and waited. And then... Daniel's window opened wide. The princes saw Daniel kneel in the open window. They heard him pray to the God of heaven. They didn't wait for Daniel to say amen. They raced to tell the other princes what they had seen and heard. Together they would go tell the king. Their plan had worked. Daniel would be thrown into the lion's den. They would be rid of him. The king was sad so sad for his friend Daniel. He was very sorry that he had sealed the law. Guards brought Daniel to the lion's den. Other guards rolled away the stone from the opening to the den. The lions were hungry. They growled. They roared so loudly the ground trembled. One guard seized Daniel's arms, another his feet. They threw him down among the roaring lions then roll the stone back in place. Suddenly, everything became quiet. The lions no longer roared. The ground no longer trembled. The proud princes smiled at one another. They were rid of Daniel. They were sure they would never see him again. But the king wept. Day turned into night. The moon came up. Hundreds and hundreds of stars sparkled in the dark night sky. The king couldn't sleep. He refused to eat. He would allow no music to be played. From time to time, he listened toward the window. Often on other nights, the lions roared. But tonight, the lions were quiet. Next morning, as soon as the sky began to come light, the king sent for his guard and hurried to the lion's den. The guard rolled away the heavy stone. Anxiously, the king called down into the den. O oh, Daniel, is thy God, whom thou servest, able to deliver thee from the lions? Would Daniel answer? Was he still alive? From down in the lion's den came Daniel's quiet voice. O oh, king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. Joyously, the king ordered the guard to take Daniel up out of the lion's den. The guard let down a rope to Daniel. Hardly was Daniel out of the den when the lions began to roar and the ground to tremble. But there wasn't a tear in Daniel's clothes. There wasn't a claw mark on his hands. There wasn't a scratch on his face. Even as God sent an angel long ago to shut the lion's mouths to keep them from hurting Daniel, just so he has promised to send an angel today to protect everyone who loves him. In his book, God has written, The Angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear or love him, and delivereth them. 
Psalm 34, 7. Do you love him? Zacchaeus the Cheater Zacchaeus was a little man. He was a rich man. But no one in all the city of Jericho liked him. It wasn't because Zacchaeus was a little man that no one liked him. It wasn't because Zacchaeus was a rich man that no one liked him. It was because Zacchaeus was a cheater. Every day he sat beside the king's money box in a tax booth where people came to pay taxes. Every day he cheated the people who came to pay. This is the way Zacchaeus cheated. If Farmer Phillips' tax was one silver coin, Zacchaeus charged him more, maybe as much as two silver coins. Farmer Philip frowned, but he had to pay. After Farmer Philip had gone on his way, Zacchaeus dropped one of the silver coins into the king's money box. But the other silver coin, he slipped into the pocket of his robe. Camel trains passed through Jericho, carrying loads of salt and spice on their humpy backs. Always the owner of the camel train must halt his camels at the tax booth and pay tax money on their loads. And always Zacchaeus charged too much tax money. Yes, Zacchaeus was a cheater. And no one, no one at all, likes a cheater. But one day, something happened that changed Zacchaeus' ways. Down on the riverbank, not far from Jericho, came John the Baptist to tell about Jesus and to tell about heaven. Zacchaeus joined the listening crowd at the river. As he listened, a wish began to grow in his heart. And the longer he listened, the bigger grew his wish. Zacchaeus wished he could change his cheating ways. But how could he change his ways? Repent, said John. Be sorry for your cheating. Pay back the money you have wrongly taken. Zacchaeus hurried away from the river. He would do as John said. He would find Farmer Philip. He would find the owner of the camel train and all the other people he had cheated. He would tell them he was sorry. He would promise to pay back the tax money that he had wrongly taken. Surely the people would believe him when he said, I'm sorry I cheated you. But when Zacchaeus said, I'm sorry, not many people believed him. They told one another, He's always been a cheater. He'll always be a cheater. They shook their heads and turned away. What's more, no one would go to Zacchaeus' house. No one would eat with him. Poor Zacchaeus. What should he do? If only he could see Jesus. Just to look on Jesus' face would help. And then one sunshiny morning, a messenger came running into the city, shouting as he ran. Ho, everyone! Jesus is coming up the road. Jesus will pass through Jericho. Men and women left their work. Boys and girls left their play. They ran to the street where Jesus would pass by. Zacchaeus didn't even take time to snatch up the king's money box. He ran with the crowd. But when Zacchaeus reached the gate where Jesus would enter Jericho, the narrow street was jammed with people. He was too short to see over their heads, and no one would make room for him. Zacchaeus ran here, he ran there trying to find a place where he could see. He must see Jesus. He had to see Jesus. But how could he? And then Zacchaeus remembered something. Zacchaeus remembered a sycamore tree that grew beside the city gate where Jesus would leave Jericho. The sycamore tree was old, so old, its branches had grown far out over the street. Zacchaeus turned face about and raced down the street ahead of the crowd. He reached the sycamore. Up, up, up he climbed. What matter if he tore his fine robe? If only he could see Jesus. Zacchaeus climbed out on a branch of the sycamore. He could see the throng far up the street. People were shouting, 
Some waved palm branches. Zacchaeus shaded his eyes to see better. The man dressed in the white robe, around whom all the crowd pressed. That man must be Jesus. And those men trying to make room for him to walk, they must be Jesus' disciples. Slowly the crowd came nearer and nearer. Closer, closer, closer came the crowd toward the sycamore tree beside the gate. Now Zacchaeus could see Jesus' face. Never had he seen a face so kind. If only he could talk to Jesus, tell him he was sorry he had cheated, tell him he would pay back all of the tax money he had falsely taken. Would Jesus believe him? Or, like those others, would Jesus shake his head and turn away? Zacchaeus leaned down to have a last look as Jesus walked under the sycamore tree. But Jesus didn't walk on. He stopped. He looked up. Zacchaeus, he said, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Zacchaeus could hardly believe what he heard. Jesus knew his name. Jesus was coming to his house. Jesus would eat with him. Zacchaeus scrambled down out of the tree. At the foot of the sycamore tree, Zacchaeus stood before Jesus and made a promise. No, he made two promises. Lord, he said, the half of all that I own I am giving to the poor. And if I have taken anything falsely, I am paying it back four times. Jesus held out his hand to Zacchaeus. Jesus believed him. Jesus believes me when beside my bed I pray. I'm sorry, Jesus, that I cheated in a game today. He holds out his hand as he did beneath the sycamore. I believe you, child. Tomorrow, play but cheat no more. Jabel the Shepherd. Jabel the Shepherd lived in a little stone hut on a rocky mountainside in Judea. Ten steps and a jump from the little stone hut, Jabel had built his sheepfold, laying stone upon stone upon stone. Jabel owned 100 sheep. There were rams with curled horns and ewes with small lambs. All the sheep, rams, ewes, and lambs, had thick woolly coats and long, fatty tails. Jabel's sheep obeyed him. When Jabel called, Tahu, come to me. His 100 sheep came running, their hoofs click, click, clacking on the stony ground of the mountain. When Jabel made the sound of a dog howling, Oh, oh, press together. The sheep huddled in a tight little group. And when Jabel said, La, la, lie down. All the 100 sheep lay down. Soon after sunup every morning, Jabel opened the sheepfold gate and called, Ta -hoo. Ta -hoo. Ma! Ma! Answered the rams. <laughs> Said the ewes. <laughs> Bleated the lambs. And they all followed Jabel down the path. Often Jabel carried the littlest lamb, while the lamb's mother walked by Jabel's side. Jabel led his 100 sheep to a green, grassy place where they could feed. But at the edge of the green, grassy place, he called, La! 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 And although the sheep were hungry, they lay down. Jabel carefully searched the green, grassy place for poisonous weeds and poisonous snakes. The weeds he pulled up. And when he hit the ground with his staff, the snakes wiggled away. Now that the green grassy place was safe for sheep, Jabel called, Tahoo! 
Come eat. While the rams and the ewes nibbled grass, the lambs played follow the leader. Around a bush here and another one there, jumping over a not too big rock, the lambs raced one after the other. When a lamb became hungry, he didn't nibble grass. He got milk from his mother. And all the while, Jabel stood by, keeping watch over his 100 sheep. In the afternoon, Jabel called, and led his sheep away from the green grassy place. A long way they must now go to find water. One drink a day was all the sheep needed, but one drink they must have. The path was stony, the bushes thorny, the caves along the way dark and deep, where Jabel led his 100 sheep. Out of a cave came a hungry wolf, sneaking, sneaking along behind the sheep. When the path led into a valley, the wolf, with a snarl and a leap, rushed at the flock of 100 sheep. The wolf's plan was to scatter the sheep, then chase a ewe or a lamb back up the valley toward his wolf cave, far away from the shepherd and the shepherd's stout staff. In a flash, Jabel leaped to a rock, calling, ooh, ooh, ooh. And though the sheep were scared and wanted to run, they obeyed Jabel's call. Together they pressed, tighter, 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 so tight the wolf could not scatter them. Then Jabel jumped down from the rock, and with his long staff, he whacked and he thwacked the robber wolf and drove him away from the sheep. After the battle with the wolf, Jabel called a gentle, and led his sheep on down the path. Soon they came to a splashing, dashing stream. Now sheep cannot drink from a splashing, dashing stream. But Jabel knew what to do. He told his sheep, La! La! Then he dammed up the splashing, dashing stream to make a quiet pool where they could drink. But one sheep disobeyed. Behind Jabel's back, one sheep slipped away up over the mountain. When the sheep had finished drinking at the quiet pool, Jabel led them home, carrying by turn the tired lambs. At the sheepfold gate, he counted his sheep as they entered one at a time. One, two, Three. He stooped to put cedar gum on a wound made by the wolf's fangs. Four, five, six. He poured oil on a tired ewe's head. On and on and on he counted to the last sheep. But the count did not come out right. One sheep was missing. Jabel closed the sheepfold gate. All but one of his 100 sheep were safe within the fold. That one had disobeyed. It had wandered away and was lost out on the mountain where wolves howled and hunted at night. Now Jabel was hungry and he was tired. But he couldn't eat and he couldn't sleep until he had found his wandering sheep. So, taking a torch to light the way, Jabel, the shepherd, set out to find his one lost sheep. Back along the stony path, Jabel trudged, searching to one side, then to the other. At the green grassy place, he looked behind bushes. He called, ta But no sheep came running to him. Past the deep, dark caves where the wolf lived, on to the splashing, dashing stream walked Jabel. Beside the quiet pool, he stopped and called again. Listen, did he hear an answer? Came faintly from over the mountain. Jabel climbed the mountain 
And there, down a steep bank, he found his lost sheep trapped in a thorny thicket. With his staff, Jabel rescued the frightened sheep. Then, placing it across his shoulder, he carried it the long way home. Jabel sang as he closed the sheepfold gate, for safe inside were his 100 sheep. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice and follow me. Jesus' sheep are all the people of the world, brown or black, red, yellow or white. The children are his lambs. Jesus cares for his sheep and lambs as did Jabel. He calls, Come unto me. I will give you food. I will give you water. I will keep you safe. 